Before starting the afternoon session, I'd like to make a public announcement. As many of you know, it, uh, we have in Holyoke and surrounding towns a lot of Latino students who would like to uh, it, uh, enter these colleges and universities in the area, it, uh, and it's not always possible for them to do so. So a group of folks many years ago, 25 years ago now, got together and founded something called the Latino Scholarship Fund, which is devoted primarily to supporting and financing those students on and also recognizing community leaders and their contributions to the, the health and continuation of activity in the community. It, uh, this, uh, every year, there is a banquet in May it, uh, at which both things occur, the recognition of the community leaders it, uh, and the uh, awarding of the scholarships. It, uh, so uh, the em emphasis this year is going to be a lot on getting the colleges and university faculty of the area involved and the staff as well in, in helping us to make a difference. So you are all invited to join with us in saying with the community, si se puede, okay, to Latino students. It, I'm reading from the in general invitation. The rising cost of attending college has led to increased frustration and even despair among working class Latino youth in our region. In response, a small group of Latino educators and community advocates have been raising funds to award community-based scholarships to these deserving students. The Latino Scholarship Fund, a nonprofit organization, gives scholarships to high-need students in Holyoke and surrounding communities at its annual banquet. A major celebration in Holyoke, the event recognizes exemplary local Latino and ally community members and college faculty and staff while celebrating student achievement. To challenge the limited exposure of these students to Latinos who are contributing on campuses and in communities, the Latino Scholarship Fund publicly awarded the scholarship at the annual Latino Scholarship Fund banquet in May at which current recipients meet previous recipients already in college. Faculty and staff from nearby colleges community leaders, and Latino Scholarship Fund banquet honorees. Some of the Latino and non-Latino adult professionals working in a range of fields to improve and enrich community, in, communities in the region. Students' intense response to, these, uh, uh, to meeting these individuals, many of these students have never even seen a Latino faculty member. Okay. It, uh, <coughs> uh, to meeting these individuals and receiving scholarship for uh, support raised primarily from their community members suggests the powerful impact of this occasion. Okay. The, the, the increased support from faculty and staff from all colleges in the region would strengthen our initiative. Our students deserve it. We are asking you to join with us then to attend the banquet on Tuesday, May 23rd at the Log Cabin in Holyoke to meet some of the students, to celebrate their determination and resilience, to make them feel inspired and yourself be inspired, and your presence alone will speak volumes to these young people. So I have some invitations here. If you want further information, you can email m, Madeline, m Malkes at hampshire.edu. Okay. And thank you for allowing me that interview. And now, let me first introduce myself. I'm Roberto Marquez. Uh, <coughs> it, uh, professor at Hampshire first, then at Mount Holyoke it, uh, for many, many years and now emeritus at both. It, uh, uh, and my field is Latin American and Caribbean culture and literature, and I also have made uh, some effort at being a translator. It, uh, 
Today we have with us a very distinguished panel. Hit this, some very heavy hitters. And they're going to be addressing the issue that follows almost in sequence from all the previous ones. We've had so far a lot of the issues and contradictions presented. This panel will be addressing the crisis in terms of analysis and solutions. Okay. So let me then move directly to the speakers, each of whom will have 15 to 20 minutes, at the, and then it will be open for questions from the floor at the, and from the panelists to each other if it should work out that way. Our first speaker is Liliana Coto Morales. <laughs> She's got a fan club. Yeah, <laughs> It, uh, Liliana Coto Morales received her BA in Sociology, Literature, and Philosophy from the University of Puerto Rico, and an MA in Social Theory from the New School of Social Research in New York. She is a member of the Association of Puerto Rican University Professors, has served as the coordinator of the PEEP in El Barrio, and was on the Committee of, the Politi of Political Education in San Juan. In 1989, she became National Coordinator of Popular Education. She brought Paulo Freire to Puerto Rico during Romero Barcelos' period of governorship, and, travel and Freire traveled through com communities and presenting programs in Puerto Rico. She is <laughs> executive producer of a documentary, Deslumbrando, Desalambrando. The Pelon, Desalambrando, directed by Pedro Rivera, and today is trying to organize projects of popular education, she notes, with very little success. But I doubt that. It, uh, she will be addressing the issue of collective actions in response to the colonial despotism of PROMESA, new vocabularies, and strategies. Again. Empiecen a contar todavía. ¿Qué tal? Ok, ¿cuál es la presentación suya? La mía es Collective Actions. Collective Actions of Resistance. If there is no feelings of uneasiness, I would certainly like that people would move a little bit for, you know, forward to feel the warmth of the bodies, because it's kind of sad to have all those uh, empty chairs in the front. If there is any uneasiness about that, there's no problem, but it's just a question of feeling better. Huh? Bueno, lo grabó. Amherst, esta es la película. Y la da dos veces ahí. Ah, míralo. Aquí, el PowerPoint. Collective. Mm. Está bien. Ah, ok. Este. Lo que pasa es que no. Yo no sé usar. Como tú tienes los números aquí, y yo los tengo acá, yo te puedo ir diciendo. So, good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to come home. Uh, in a way, Amherst is, a, is another home for me. It's part of those experiences that one can call epiphany experiences. I don't know if one can say epiphanic, but these epiphany experiences. So, uh, so I'm so glad I'm here, and I'm so honored that I'd be able to be with friends in different endeavors here. So uh, Sonia was asking me why, why I was practicing. 
It's just that I have to put everything in 20 minutes. And uh, it's difficult for me when there is so much emotion and enthusiasm with the subject that what one is dealing with. Oh, this is the name. Uh, we'll go to the next one. El único camino para pensar el futuro parece ser la utopía. This is the Sousa Santos. But I have to complement that with a Freire's phrase that la utopía es un proyecto realizable. So I'm not going to go into that, but Freire used to say that Utopia was not an unreliable project, it was a reliable, uh, a reliable uh, real, un proyecto realizable. Bueno, seguimos. So this is, a, this is a statement that was presented by one of the projects that I, am, I will be working on here, which is Trayecto Dignidad by the collective Somos Dignos. I am not going to read it because Agustin is going to read it. We're going to ask people to sign for it. But in the section that is called uh, uh, Citizens' Actions, they present this uh, uh, material. You know, why is it that we are supporting the this, this strike? Can go to the next one. Okay. I will focus on collective actions of resistance which may not be mainstream, but express new sensibilities with respect to conflicts, exclusions, inequalities, and other social contradictions. I will be talking about organizations that engage in collective actions against the Law Promesa. There you have the complete name of the Law Promesa. These organizations are Trayecto Dignidad which the organization is really Somos Dignos, Jornada Se Acabaron Las Promesas, Movimiento Unión Soberanista, Campamento Contra la Junta, La Organización Vamos, and the spokesperson of Concertación Contra la Junta were not able to be interviewed. I have interviewed some of these members in the context of the UPRP work stoppage, and afterwards, when students, professors, and non-teaching employees decided on their national assemblies to turn the stoppage into a strike. So I've been doing this right before coming over here. I am including the actions of the students as another example of strategies called prefigurative strategies. All are organizational initiatives that value participation and democracy. Some, as jornadas se acabaron las promesas, engage in direct confrontational actors. Others, as vamos, pose the need to engage in autonomous, productive, ur and urbanistic activities to build a new political paradigm. The, the next one. Uh, here, uh, before there was the press conference, press conference of, if you can go back just for them to see, that was the press conference of a, a, a Trayecto Dignidad, where they gave the results that I am giving to you in papers, the results of the poll of the study that they did. And over here is the performing part of Proyecto Dignidad, which means that, we, that, the, 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 that the, they, they do like a show. There is a show, a call, and dialogue with the people. Okay? So they end up. Here, that is the APO, Asociación Puerto Riqueña de Profesores Universitarios. Their identity is Profesores Universitarios. We cannot be unionized because legally we cannot unionize. But there is the street and the National Assembly. Uh, these, uh, are the, these are the actions and activities generated by groups like the APO with certain objectives related to their chosen identities and their position in a social conflict. It is my own interpretation of Melucci's notion. They may include a variety of work groups, and they say communitarian, patriotic, etc., etc. But they can also be protests, sit-ins, civil disobedience actions, strikes, boycotts, and other social struggles, which, under certain conditions, may develop into broad of social fields of social movements. But my opinion is that a public event, a campaign, a controversial meeting or any other public behaviors are not necessarily equivalent to the movement with capital letters. They have their own value, both empirically and analytically. The fact that a collective action is a collective action and not the movement does not diminish their social and political value at all, nor their value as research subjects. Some see themselves, the next one, as territories of resistance. Within these spaces, grassroots activists are not waiting to change to be struck to the change to be structured from above. They commit themselves to developing new anti-hierarchical relationships and participatory dynamics from below. This does not exclude the fact that the same rhetoric uh, uh, is reproduced by other vertical organizations 
that reproduce vertical relationships and other traditional forms of organization. Participation and horizontalism become the guiding discourses of these activities. Some of them implement strategically novel actions which are, as we have said, prefigurative processes and practices which are in themselves transformative. And for some of them, they represent a new way of viewing social and political change, a different way of reinventing the left. This is one of the actions of Se Acabaron Las Promesas. And one of the things that they say in their interviews, that their actions are surprising, and uh, surprising in two senses. Surprising because people don't expect them. And surprising because when people expect that they'll do something else, they just retreat. And so uh, at this point, as they say, they have not, they have not done anything that the others, and we're talking about Carrión and the people from the Junta, etc., were expecting. And so this is the type of, of direct action that they are talking to. Uh, this view has also been developed by Boaventura de Sousa Santos. We can put it here. The next one. When he talks about the World Social Forum as one of the most eloquent manifestations on anti-hegemonic hegemonic, uh, globalization, uh, another word is possible expresses a transformative perspective of, of collective actions where participation and democratic processes are central. A strategic approach that is viewed as capable of reconfiguring, says Boaventura, the social transformative practices of the global left. Uh, so this is the social forum of Puerto Rico. And I have to say that, I don't know if you remember that we brought this, this is a mobile mural, a mobile mural. We did it in, in, in cloth. It was seven feet tall and 70 feet long. And we brought it here, so, uh, but then it was destroyed in front of the Capitol Hill in Puerto Rico. We never knew who destroyed it. Uh, another, uh, so the other one is just to say that these are the organizations. This is uh, Monreal, Monreal, the World Social Forum in, in 2016. So it's just to say that the, the World Social Forum is still alive. Okay, again. These are the organizations that I tried to interview. The only one that, was not, that I was not able to interview was the Concentración Contra la Junta and the University Strike. Go ahead. And this is the next one. This is like, a, the, the, like some sort of a, of a matrix that I prepared in order to uh, organize the, the investigation. And the categories were date of origin, membership and participants, objectives, theoretical and ideological basis, strategies and tactics, impact in individual and collective subjectivities, strategies of communication, actions against PROMESA, leadership and organizational structure. Of course, I will not have time to do so here, but it's just for you to know what was the, the basis of the interviews. Go ahead, next one. <clears throat> the combined actions of organizations, spontaneous groups, individual common citizens initiatives may or may not develop into social movements. And I just wanted to give you a sense. Uh, next one. This is the Rescate Movement, which was the, the, the first poor people's movement in the 20th century in Puerto Rico, and I've studied it in my book, and it's part of that, of the documentary that we're going, that I have produced. And the other one, as you see, there are two different strategies, but I don't have the time to talk about strategies, but there are two different tactics in terms of the, of the, the process of a protest. The next one, Vieques, which everybody has seen. So these are two, I would say, precursors of the situation uh, now in Puerto Rico. Nevertheless, there are also both local micro, micro, micro campaigns and road mobilization, even if they are eminently by the media, they post proposal vis-a-vis -vis the crisis. But in my view, the systematization, to use the term of popular education of these proposals, require a conscientious design of transformative praxis in order to build a broad social movement. So it's not a question of spontaneous activities all the time. And the next one here is Tito Kayak. Tito Kayak has brought to conscious many people some people love him, some people hate him, some people discuss about him. So it's in, in, in Espanol one can say mediatic, but uh, mediatico, I don't know if in English that's correct. But it's a media approach to discuss issues. But I still think that even though Tito Kayak, as a matter of fact, the whole, uh, the, the whole the campamentos in Vieques began with Tito when he said, I am not moving from here. You know, it began with Tito. But 
there is a need of a more conscientious, systematic process of, of, of the development of anti-colonial consciousness in the people. The profile of collective actions and social movements has changed. In response, social actors redefine their identities and alliance strategies and have shifted the locus of their efforts from making demands on the state to attempting to transform society. La próxima. Okay. These initiatives are exemplified in Puerto Rico besides by organizations, evidently political organizations. And remember, I am talking here about organ the organizations that I, that I have interviewed. I am not talking about the PPT or the PEEP, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking about those that I am interviewed. And, um, but there are others, and that is the growth of communitarian productive enterprises, such as agricultural markets of different kinds. Some examples are the agricultural markets of the Roosevelt Square, the Cainito community, and many in different towns in Puerto Rico. Some are organic, some are not organic. Some have lechon asado, alcaburria, and the others are organic. So you have a variety because nothing here is black and white. Everything is like a degree, no? So, huh? these are initiatives to transform society, 15. Yeah. Uh, to transform society. The common denominators between these organizations and other democratic organizations are uh, that they are youth oriented, that they are uh, that they are not necessarily a confrontation with the state. And could you go to the other one? They are democratic, they, they defend democratic procedures and they tend towards a different notion of production. Okay, so um, what I'm going to say, I'm going to go to the university, to the university and then mention uh, Trayectorio Dignidad, which you have the, the material of Trayectorio Dignidad. Trayectorio Dignidad, when I get there, we can uh, discuss it. I am going now to go to the university as an example of this other organization that on, on, on happily I will not be able to discuss unless you ask me questions afterwards. The students at the University of Puerto Rico in the campuses, we can go to the next one. This is the combination of activities, you see? Like for instance, you have the campamento which is uh, resistant. You have there the campamento with the community organizations that it's called Urbe a Pie, and they're doing the campamento, but also some sort of community or, or community work. You have a huerto here, and you have over there the occupation of a building that is called Casa Taft. These are the people uh, that are in this exp exposition. I will leave the catalog of the exposition in the libraries here. It is a participatory exposition. Among the students on strike, even among those in favor in keeping the university open, and among groups that the ones that are being discussed here, there is a consciousness that differences have to be worked together. Differences should not present effective collective action. This may result in the polarizing political polarization. The presence of these actors are two pathologies, as Boaventura says. The representation pathology, these are people that don't feel that they are represented, and the participation pathology, which they want to participate. I am not going to talk about the University of Social Movements, but I am going to say that the strategies being practiced at the UPR, vis-a-vis -vis the economic cuts imposed by the Junta, are the first steps toward a university, globalized university, a different university, committed to the common good. The university as it is today, the modern university, has to be reformed both by university people. It requires the strengthening of the university's social responsibility and the creation of the new institution. This kind of organization, if opted for, will take time. In the meantime, a counter-university that creates innovative ways of combining popular and scientific knowledge has to be developed. This is being done by the UPR strike participants and even by those sectors that oppose this strategic decision. And uh, now, I would like, could you go ahead? This is about Trayecto Dignidad, uh, which uh, it's, m the Trayecto Dignidad has had four editions. And what they do is that they go north, <coughs> south, east, and west in buses, and they do this, uh, these exchanges with the people in the, in the beaches, in plazas, in, uh, in, in centros comerciales, etc. And they do three things. They do the performance, they do, could you go ahead with the other one? 
they, uh, this is the university, that's so where we get there. They do the performance, they do the poll, which you have the results of the poll here. The importance of the poll is that it's, there were 1,200 people in, uh, uh, that was uh, interviewed, and the results are very different than the results of the opinions as they come out from the press. And that is the important thing. And the Trayecto Dignidad, I think it's important because it's long term, because it's profound, because it deals with culture and it deals also with research. And uh, here, now we're going to go to uh, uh, experiences at the university. This is one of the performances of Trayecto Dignidad. Could you go ahead? This is also uh, the logistics aspect, aspect of the struggle because I think that one has to see that the students are not there in a, in a completely disorganized fashion. They have organized food, they have organized the bathrooms. I just wanted you to see the thing of the bathrooms. You have to clean the bathrooms. There is a whole debate in terms of gender about, about work, you know, and they have the mobilization aspect. Could you go? And this is the performance. Go ahead, go ahead. These are the results. You have those results there. And if you want to look at them, at the end in questions, we can discuss those results. That's why I think that they are so important. And this is the Movimiento Unión Soberanista, which is a, a, move, a, a group of older people, 55 to 60. And um, the details about the Movimiento Soberanista, I can give you if, if you ask me after, after. Could you go ahead? Okay, and the Movimiento Soberanista, as you can see, the age is different. <laughs> and there are, uh, these are, this is a, a, a comparison. Se acabaron las promesas, the Movimiento Vamos, which is a movement that's younger than Moderanista, but not young, and Campamento Contra la Junta, which is a move, this Campamento contra la, contra la Junta was founded by five women. And the majority of the participants, as the interviewer told me, were women and LGBT and queer groups. And in that sense, women are very, the, the Campamento Contra la Junta and La Jornada, they don't talk about quotas. I mean, women are dirigentes, that's what they say. Uh, and I listen to what they say. Uh, so this is an interesting thing because the whole issue that comes out at the university of gender is being dealt in another fashion. Women are there, they have power, and we don't have to discuss that. If that is true or not, we have to see. Uh, and then, I still have one minute. University strike, okay. So here I wanted to, to deal with issues. These are logistic issues. You know, this is the way the space is organized. If you're a, an urban sociologist, you're interested in know how the space is organized. First, we saw how the food is organized. And the food is organized from the Centro de Estudiantes, it's distributed. But each, each portón, each gate, has a food organization on its own. And there's a whole debate about who takes care of that in terms of men and women. And, but here is the space. This is also the political organization, okay. The political organization, you see, there is the coordinating group, and there are debates about the power issues because the people at the gates say that they are autonomous. So the autonomy, the sovereignty of the whole process in the, in the, in the, stri in the strike is at the level of the gate. But there is this organization that is called the assembly, but there it's called the pleno. Go ahead, I, I just have a minute. And this is interesting because in sociales, every day they have a word, an important word. Go ahead. This is the educational aspect. The educational aspect, constant workshops. This is on neoliberalism. There were on women in struggle. There was on the debt. There, uh, Martinez Heriberto went uh, there, you know, talking about alternatives, and to present what they call the bank of proposals. The bank of proposals, okay? And here I am very proud of my generation because this is a group of people of my age that have the, the decided to do murals. And this is one of the murals of uh, Segurola, I don't know if some people know Segurola. So there are about 10 pe persons about my age that are, they are doing murals in support uh, of the struggle against Promesa. So go ahead. This is the visual, the visual in support of, of the auditing of the debt and um, the religious groups that were supporting. That's another aspect, the, the interreligious coalition. And here is the front gate of, of the Puerto Rico, 
of the Puerto Rican University, UPR. The next one. These are messages that I think that the students are trying to send. La promesa es la And this one, I don't have to say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is why I think that with all comings and goings, contradictions, debates, and problems, there is a, 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 a whole new set of relationships and ideas that are being developed and that we have to check on them because probably there is the seed of a future Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker is Dr. Jorge Duani. Dr. Duani is director of the Cuban Research Institute and professor of anthropology in the Department of Global and Social Cultural Studies in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University. Born in Cuba, and raised in Panama and Puerto Rico. Dr. Duani previously served as acting dean of the College of Social Sciences, professor of anthropology, chair of the department, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, director of the journal Revista de Ciencias Sociales at Ciencias Sociales at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. He was held, he has held visiting research and teaching appointments at several U.S. universities, including Harvard, Connecticut, Wisconsin, Florida, <coughs> uh, excuse me, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and the, and the City University of New York. He earned his PhD in Latin American Studies, specializing in anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. He holds an MA in Social Sciences from the University of Chicago and an MBA in Psychology from Columbia University. Dr. Duani has published extensively on migration, ethnicity, race, nationalism, and transnationalism in Cuba, the Caribbean, and the United States. He has also written about Cuban cultural identity on the island and in the diaspora, especially as expressed in literature, music, and religion. He has belonged to the editorial boards of academic journals such as Cuban Studies, Latino Studies, Centro, <coughs> it, uh, Latin American uh, and Caribbean Ethnic Studies, and the New West Indian Guide. As someone who's, he's also just published a book called Puerto Rico, Everything You Need to Know. And as someone who has just finished reading that book, I can very highly recommend it, I consider it the most compact, okay, and up-to-date and informed, generally accessible, okay, and non-intimidating presentation of the current Puerto Rican situation that I've read in the last year. It, uh, and so I would like to very highly recommend it to you. <laughs> Between February 2003 and March 2017, Dr. Duani wrote a monthly editorial column for the newspaper El Nuevo Día, and he received the Bolivar Pagan Prize in Journalism from the Institute of Puerto Rican, of, of Puerto Rican Literature. Okay. Dr. Duani will be addressing the topic economic crisis and migration in Puerto Rico. And without further ado, I give you Professor Duani. Thank you, Roberto, for your very kind words. And uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation, as well as to the members of the panel, Roberto, Liliana, Jose, and Emilio. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about something that is quite depressing, uh, and I hope to make it a little uh, more uh, uh, optimistic, especially at the very end, because I think the numbers I'm going to show you uh, document a very difficult situation uh, for thousands of Puerto Ricans who have had to leave the island in the last 10 years or so because of the economic crisis. And unfortunately, I think uh, all the indicators suggest that this massive movement of Puerto Ricans from the island to the mainland will continue, uh, at least in the next decade. 
So um, let me begin with uh, a general picture of how population has uh, developed over the, the past hundred years or so since the first U.S. Census of the island was conducted in 1898 uh, in terms of the population growth. And you probably know this. Uh, I, I'm just going to show you uh, the figures that during the first half of the 20th century, Puerto Rico was going, growing very quickly, so much so that the dominant uh, perception was that Puerto Rico was a small, overpopulated uh, little island with few natural resources and therefore uh, one of the uh, main ways in which development could be uh, obtained was to reducing uh, population um, uh, on the island. And that's what you see uh, for the first time actually uh, in the 1950s uh, and on to, to this day. And uh, there were a couple of references in earlier panels to the issue of sterilization, which is certainly one of the ways in which uh, the Puerto Rican population growth was, was kept uh, to a smaller uh, percentage. And of course, migration. Migration served as a safety valve. Uh, and that's the word, actually, uh, the expression that was used by the P Puerto Rican government uh, and even the colonial government before 1952 in order to export uh, surplus labor, as uh, it was called then. And I'm also reminded of a phrase that Fran Bonilla, the famous scholar of Puerto Rican migration, used at one point in time in which he said that actually manos a la obra or you know, um, Operation Bootstrap could have been called manos que sobran because in fact that was the idea. The idea was that you had to get rid of all these excess workers, surplus workers, and relocate them here uh, on, on, in, uh, in the mainland. And of course, be careful what you wish for because that's exactly what has happened and I'll show you some figures in a moment. Now, in the 1960s, population growth uh, recovered uh, on the island as uh, uh, migration uh, appeared to be uh, leveling off. But of course, now we know better. We know that migration was never really um, um, ending uh, in that period. But there was a, a return migration flow in the 1970s. I'll, I'll just show you the, the entire sequence so you'll see what happened. Of course, for the first time in the modern history of Puerto Rico, there was a 2.2% a, a uh, decline between the, the census uh, conducted in 2000 and the census conducted in the, in the 2010 period. No other state or jurisdiction, I think it was only Vermont perhaps, which also underwent a decline, and no city uh, ex except for Detroit actually lost population during that period. But then look at what happened in the last uh, five years or in the first five years of the uh, current decade. The loss of population actually was even larger than during the early uh, uh, period, the, uh, the first decade of the, of the 21st century. Something like 8.8% 8 .8 of the population uh, declined. And if you add up uh, those two figures, we're talking about a significant proportion of the population that relocated here uh, in the United States. Of course, I have to say I'm not going to focus on that because of time uh, uh, constraints. But it isn't just migration. It's also the demographic. Uh, characteristics of Puerto Rico, fertility uh, rates have come down, mortality rates also as well. And in fact, something that I, I don't have time to talk about here, return migration has also slowed down. And finally, uh, foreign immigration, especially from the Dominican Republic, appears to have stagnated. So all those uh, demographic factors uh, uh, have uh, contributed to this uh, very uh, difficult demographic picture that I'm going to comment on. And of course, my, my focus will be on the growth of the Puerto Rican population in the United States compared to the Puerto Rican population on the island. And here are the, uh, the main uh, figures that I want to comment on. Um, again, uh, until about 1940, the Puerto Rican population, this is the, the, uh, the number of people on the island. Let me show you uh, the other uh, half of the uh, picture. Uh, until 1940, the Puerto Rican population on, uh, on the mainland was practically insignificant. There were a few thousand people who had settled in New York City. Earlier, some people had left to uh, work in Hawaiian plantations. Some Puerto Ricans have ventured to Cuba or the Dominican Republic. But really, uh, and you can see this very clearly here, <clears throat> these are the census figures uh, uh, from the early uh, 20th century to the last estimates in 2015. The spectacular growth of the Puerto Rican population in the mainland, uh, especially after World War II, but um, sometime in the first decade of this century, in the 21st century, I think it was 2004, for the first time, uh, the census estimated that there were more people of Puerto Rican origin living in the 50 United States, and that has continued to grow, uh, as you can see. And by now, something like 63% of all people who declare themselves to be Puerto Rican, that includes people born on the island, as well as uh, descendants of Puerto Ricans born in the US, has uh, skyrocketed. And, and if you project that into the next decade, that will probably continue 
as the, the population of the island decreases, and uh, actually the census estimates by, by, by the year 2050, there will be less than 3 million people uh, on the island compared to 6 million Puerto Ricans, so double the, the numbers. So this is a striking demographic uh, phenomenon, and uh, it's one that uh, many scholars on the island and the mainland are, are trying to grapple with. I myself, uh, I'm not a demographer, but I look at these numbers and try to understand what are the uh, social, economic, uh, and cultural repercussions, as well as probably political ones as well. Just to focus on the more recent immigration uh, from the island to the US, uh, I, I collected these uh, uh, official numbers from the census from 2000 to uh, 2015. And again, you can see pretty much what the pattern has been uh, uh, from about 50,000 people who were leaving per year in the year 2000. The last estimates uh, suggest that we have now reached something like 89,000 people who left the island in just that one year. I should uh, also qualify this by saying that we're talking about absolute numbers, not net migration specifically, it depends on how you calculate that. But if you uh, consider net uh, migration, then you would have something like uh, perhaps <coughs> uh, 65,000 because still you have a small number, 20, 25 people, uh, 25,000 people who are uh, Puerto Ricans living in the US who are returning uh, to, to Puerto Rico, as well as their descendants, the so-called New Ricans as they're called on the island. So we're seeing a, a, a very steady and growing uh, number of Puerto Ricans who, uh, especially since the beginning of the economic recession in 2006, have decided to relocate uh, in the United States. The other important aspect, I think, of this uh, phenomenon is to see some of the geographic redistribution of the Puerto Rican population uh, in the United States. I take this chart from Angelo Falcón, the Atlas of Puerto Rican Migration, which is a little confusing because of all the arrows and so on, but let me just uh, mention some of the main patterns. So Puerto Ricans are still going to New York, uh, and New York is one of the primary destinations, but of course Florida has taken over as the number one destination for, for, for Puerto Ricans. I'll show you some more detailed numbers on that in a moment. Uh, then of course the Northeast area, including Massachusetts, uh, the Boston area, Hartford, Connecticut, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, continue to attract a large number of, of Puerto Ricans. Smaller numbers were going to Texas and California to the south and the west and then uh, smaller numbers who are going to the Midwest, places in Illinois, Ohio, and so on. Some of the other arrows uh, going back and forth suggest that there's also a redistribution of the so-called, uh, well, uh, New Yorkian population or uh, Northeastern-based uh, uh, Puerto Rican population who are moving south, and that's uh, a significant number of people. For instance, in Orlando, about half of all Puerto Ricans actually come from this area, from, uh, the, from North Northeastern United States particularly from New York, New Jersey, and, and Connecticut, uh, as well as Massachusetts. Uh, so you have this uh, revolu, this very complicated uh, <laughs> movement of people going back and forth, uh, circulating, uh, you know, moving from one place to another. Uh, I have called it uh, a nation on the move, or nación en vaivén, but it's actually getting more complicated than that. It's not just people coming and going, it's establishing new patterns of, of settlement. And I think we're still trying to understand uh, and interpret what that, uh, what that means. Uh, in order to make it a little more uh, clear, uh, clearer, I want to focus on the five states in which Puerto Ricans have concentrated since uh, uh, World War II. Uh, and I begin in 1970 because I think it's, that this is when you begin to see the, the pattern. Uh, until then, New York uh, had been, and unfortunately, this is a red one, the red line here, you can't see the, the, the legend. But this is New York, which has always been since the 1940s and 50s, the main Puerto Rican community. But notice what happens in New York. Uh, it grew uh, somewhat uh, in the 20 year period in 1970 and 90, and then it actually declined somewhat in the 1990s only to recover very uh, slowly. And actually it's a steady pattern in the last uh, couple of decades. If you look at the others, this is New Jersey, the, uh, the orange line. Uh, New Jersey has grown uh, as well. It, it has been traditionally the second largest uh, Puerto Rican population in the United States, uh, but as we'll see in a moment, uh, and this is Illinois, this is uh, the green line, uh, the, um, the growth of uh, the Pennsylvania uh, population as well, but look at what happens when we include Florida. This is really a, a very striking uh, and, and very sudden uh, growth of uh, a population that was practically insignificant in 1970. Then after Disney World was uh, opened in 1971, I've used the word Disney Rican before, but I'm not sure that it, uh, it applies. But anyway, the, the, the growth of Puerto Ricans in, in Orlando 
particularly in Florida in general, has been spectacular. And look at what happens uh, in the last decade. It, uh, the, the growth of the Puerto Rican population has overcome uh, the number of Puerto Ricans living in New York. Uh, so the word New Yorican, for instance, if it ever was uh, applicable, and of course it has all kinds of negative connotations, as you know, uh, no longer describes the majority of Puerto Ricans in the US. It's actually Flory Ricans, if you want to use that word. Only about one third of all Puerto Ricans in the US are now living in New York. Uh, and again, if this trend continues, well, it's already more than a million, uh, 1.2 or 3 million uh, people of Puerto Rican origin living in Florida. Uh, clearly, uh, New York City, which again is still the largest single concentration, I'll show you that in a moment, uh, um, uh, the single lar largest concentration of Puerto Ricans will be overcome by Orlando, uh, considering Orlando as a, as a major metropolitan area. So where are Puerto Ricans going to now? These are the 10 uh, main <coughs> counties uh, in the US. Uh, over the, you know, the first four years of the 2010 uh, decade. Uh, they're, they're going to Florida, uh, particularly to five counties in Florida, so beginning from uh, down uh, up, up, up to the, the first one, it's Palm Beach, uh, Broward County, Hartford, of course in Connecticut, Osceola, this is Disney, Hillsboro, which is Tampa, and then look at what happens in Orange County. Orange County is really the epicenter of the, of the new uh, Puerto Rican migration and uh, the increasing uh, number of Puerto Ricans who are concentrating in that particular county, and if you combine Orange and Osceola, it's even more impressive with uh, more than uh, 50,000 people just in four years. Uh, we're not talking about the entire phenomenon. I, uh, I consulted with some uh, local experts like Roberto Marquez uh, uh, about the, uh, uh, the uh, appearance of Hamden, Massachusetts, uh, number nine on the list, which I don't know personally, but I understand it's part of the historical uh, uh, trajectory of Puerto Ricans coming to the Connecticut River Valley and, and has to do apparently with the tobacco industry uh, uh, in the 1940s and 50s. And, and of course, that's also connected to Hartford, to Hartford, Connecticut. Notice that the Bronx, which was uh, until recently number one on the list, is now number three. Orange, Hillsboro, and the other Florida counties are really attracting the largest number of Puerto Ricans in the last decade. And even you could go back uh, in, the, in the earlier decade and you would find the same pattern. So I think this is something that we need to uh, describe and understand better. And I think it has to do with the crisis, the economic crisis in Puerto Rico, as well as different kinds of opportunities and networks here in the United States. And people are, are choosing different places where they go. There has been a long-term <coughs> movement away from the large metropolitan areas in the Northeast to mid-sized uh, uh, cities uh, in, in, in other parts of, of the US. Uh, but clearly, the, the North-South movement is, is now the prevalent one uh, in uh, Puerto Rican, contemporary Puerto Rican migration. Another way to, uh, of illustrating this is to look at the, main, the five main metropolitan areas. So New York City is still the largest one, uh, with about 800,000 people of Puerto Rican origin. But Orlando has clearly grown in a very quick way. And uh, uh, although I don't see it going to uh, overcome New York in the next few years, it probably will uh, in maybe 20 years or so. And notice, too, that Miami doesn't figure prominently in anybody's uh, you know, agenda, research agenda. I, and I happen to live in Miami. This is Miami metropolitan area. It's not just the city, but also for Lauderdale and West Palm Beach. It has a significant amount. Uh, more than 200,000 Puerto Ricans are living now spread out in South Florida. Uh, Chicago, which used to be number two for a long time, is now really uh, stagnated. Philadelphia is growing, especially uh, outside of the uh, main metropolitan area. So uh, we're, we're, what we're seeing, I think, is a number of shifts in the uh, settlement patterns of Puerto Ricans that imply all kinds of things, uh, new labor markets, uh, networks, uh, uh, opportunities, interactions with other ethnic groups like, uh, for instance, Cubans in South Florida uh, and, uh, and other places as well. So it's a new uh, situation that we need to study in, in more detail and understand better what are the challenges and the opportunities that Puerto Ricans are fa facing in those uh, areas. Now, in the last part of my presentation, what I'd like to do is to quickly go to some of, some of the main consequences of this huge diaspora, a renewed diaspora. Uh, Maria Luz de Santiago uh, presented yesterday some numbers of the last decade. Uh, I think it was about a quarter of a million people. But if you go back to 2000, we're talking about at least half a million people who have left Puerto Rico in this uh, period of time. So how does that affect uh, people who are, uh, we saw some images uh, earlier about people who say, you know, me quito, I'm not leaving. 
Uh, and of course, the, the other reaction that I heard yesterday, yo tampoco me fit to the ones who are, who are here uh, in the US because they still feel Puerto Rican. <coughs> but anyway, demographically, I think the main uh, consequence is precisely this, this issue. Perhaps the photograph is a little too exaggerated. Viejo San Juan is not always empty, but uh, less people on the island, certainly. And the trend toward a decreasing number of people living in, uh, on the island seems to be inexorable. I, I don't foresee any kind of um, uh, renewed population growth uh, on the island uh, anytime soon. Uh, that has all kinds of uh, impacts, including the issue of who's leaving. No? So it's not just that a lot of people are leaving, it's that it's mostly young, uh, relatively well-educated people, uh, many of them uh, graduates of the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, most of my former students in anthropology are not working uh, on the island, but are here. Uh, and an aging society, the distribution of the, the age structure of Puerto Rico is clearly one of the, the main challenges, I would say, for any kind of planning, any, time of, any kind of policy in the next few years. Puerto Rico is already, a very, uh, ha already has a very high percentage of people over 65 years old, <coughs> even more than, than in the U.S. I think it's about 15 to 16 percent, if I don't remember, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And it's also the, uh, the most uh, advanced uh, uh, population, age population structure in Latin America, uh, except for Cuba, which also has a very difficult situation facing a, a, a larger number. And I wanted to use this picture as well to remind you of one other aspect, which is most of the women, most of the elderly women in Puerto Rico, especially after seven, you know, beyond 75 years old, are women. And they are widows. Uh, and they are oftentimes by themselves. And they're poor. Uh, many, in many cases, of course, abuelas are the ones who take care of uh, the younger children. But this is an issue that, regardless of what kind of uh, program and what kind of political status uh, uh, will uh, face Puerto Rico, uh, it will clearly be something to, to think about and to uh, take measure on. And of course, at the other extreme, uh, Puerto Rico is already a country with a very small percentage of uh, children uh, at all ages under 18. Uh, and that has to do, it has been mentioned before, the closing of public and private schools. Uh, the university itself is facing a, a demographic crisis insofar as fewer and fewer uh, uh, students are graduating from high school, applying to, to college and university. So uh, that is one other demographic aspect. And again, it has to do with migration. It's not the only issue, but it's, it's only one of them. The decreasing demand for consumption, the, the fact that there are so many uh, places that are now closing down, uh, the vacancy rate, uh, which is extremely high in Puerto Rico, are all related to these demographic changes, uh, and particularly to uh, the out-migration of young people from the island. A decreasing tax base. Somebody used, I think, the same image before uh, uh, of the Old San Juan um, murals, uh, um, uh, but also with, with this particular image of, of a woman uh, with her luggage. So the fact that people are leaving and that these people are not paying taxes in Puerto Rico has just recently become an object of, of at least journalistic attention. And it, it is a problem. There are you know, thousands of people who are not paying taxes in Puerto Rico. So that uh, will lead, again, to a shrinking tax base on the island, aggravating all the problems that we've been talking about since yesterday. And I want to end uh, on the one I think is uh, an optimistic note. Uh, <laughs> I, I usually uh, uh, present this uh, image. Uh, this is from Orlando, the uh, Festival uh, Boricua de Orlando. Uh, uh, of course, whenever you have two or three Puerto Ricans, you have a festival. And, uh, <laughs> but this one in particular, I think, is, it captures much of the, the mood that I want to sort of end on, which is despite all of these uh, difficult economic uh, and demographic, as well as political challenges, the diaspora in the United States is uh, reaffirming its sense of Puerto Ricanness. Uh, you know, and it's not just a flag, it's not just Arroz con Gandules and other uh, perhaps more daily kinds, but it's also the kinds of efforts that we've, we've learned about in this conference, organizing and, and trying to uh, uh, impact uh, you know, what's going on on the island and, and helping uh, to uh, uh, provide for uh, different alternatives to, to the crisis. And, and, and finally, I think the issue of transnationalism is something that, that needs to be uh, considered uh, because of the fact that so many Puerto Ricans are living now in the United States. That does not necessarily mean that they are quitándose, that they are abandoning their country or you know, all of a sudden forgetting the Puerto Rican. In fact, in many ways, I think Puerto Rican culture is being recreated and transformed, of course, uh, here in the United States, wherever Puerto Ricans are uh, settling. So thank you very much. Thank you.